we have Robin's rehab here tonight, um, and this will be one of a three-part series masterclass. And we're going to be going over different parts of the anatomy tonight, focusing on the foot and ankle. Um, without further ado, uh, please welcome Travis and Dakota from Robin's Rehab. Thanks for showing up. When they said you, they would get you guys to meet at 8 o'clock at night, I would be like, there's no way I'm getting my staff to show up anywhere at 8 o'clock unless it's at a bar. So this is impressive. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe next class. So we're going to go over, um, so basically it's really, I want to learn about how you guys evaluate the foot and we're going to teach you a couple things about how we evaluate the foot and give you guys some tools to work with the people that come into your store. So people come into your store with foot pain and people come into our shop with foot pain. Um, we're going to handle it differently than you guys would, but we want to try to give you guys some tools to try to fix some of the smaller problems, like identify little things that um, you can certainly correct the shoes. And then if it becomes a bigger problem, that's when we kind of are a little bit more helpful. So everybody has a handout here. And we're recording this. Um, so we'll uh, get you a video of this. If you guys like want to study it and you want to like something to, when you go to sleep at night, you need something to pour yourself into that. But there will be a quiz when we come back. So there's going to be some prizes that we're going to give away. Um, so just uh, pay attention. We'll make it super hard, but it's just to kind of make sure you guys are paying attention and actually um, not even listen now, but apply this stuff. I want you guys to start using this stuff um, with the people that are coming to your store. So um, foot and ankle evaluation. When you're evaluating the foot and ankle, there's all these terms you guys have probably heard before. Uh, if you guys uh, have any questions about anything, just make sure you stop us in the middle uh, where you store our patients stopping us and ask a bunch of questions. So you guys can certainly stop and ask questions if you have that. Um, but for the most part, there, there's a lot of different diagnoses that uh, you can have foot and ankle problems for, uh, but this is a majority of them. You guys have probably heard of these issues, but plantar fascia, anybody know what plantar fascia is? Yeah? What is it? What, that, like what it is? Yes, what is plantar fascia? That's, well, that's the itis of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's right, yes, the inflammation, yeah. Is this part of your foot? So it's the arch and everything. Okay. Yeah, so it's the connective tissue that's on the bottom of your foot. What's the job of the plantar fascia? Anybody know? To protect. You protect the arch. It holds the structure of the foot. So it acts like a ligament. So anybody know the difference between a ligament and a tendon? Bones versus cartilage. So cartilage is something a little bit different, right? So ligaments attach bone to bone. And they don't like contract and relax like a muscle will. It will kind of stretch them. So the plantar fascia is really tough tissue on the bottom of the foot that uh, protects the arch, and it, it's part of transition. So when you guys are running, right? So whether you're, you know, a heel strike or you're a four foot strike, um, your plantar fascia it has to be really, really strong or durable in order for you to tolerate doing like at a mile. Anybody know how many times you, your foot hits the ground in a mile? How many steps are in a mile when you're running? You guys are the running people, right? <laughs> so how many steps? How many steps in a mile? About 1,000. So if someone runs five miles, they're hitting the pavement 5,000 times. Okay, so that, that tissue's got to be really durable. Um, so and when you're doing that, it makes sense. That's some of the tissue that can fail. It's pretty common. If someone says heel pain, uh, almost always the plantar fascia fault. Not always, but almost always the plantar fascia fault. Posterior tip tendon, anybody know where that is? So that's a tendon that runs from the inside of your shin, it's all the way down, goes under this bump in your foot and attaches right here. What do you think this muscle does? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you have an anatomy test, is that what's going on? Um, I'm actually taking the MPP in January. Nice, right. All right, so she know what this is. What, what's, the yeah. job of, what's the job of the poster tip? Oh God! Uh, <laughs> uh, that's true. Flexion. That is its action. But okay. what is what is its job? What's it supposed to do? Supports if, the medial arch. As exactly. Well. Man, this guy's smart. He's gonna kill that test. Okay. So <laughs> it supports the medial arch. It's a really small muscle. Okay. But it's supposed to kind of support your arch, so that when you hit the ground, it protects the arch and it doesn't allow it to like over pronate or your foot gets flat. Right. So when you're running. Um, how many times your body weight is going through your foot when you're running, like at a pretty good pace? What do you think? Three times. So what, three times? Anybody else? Five. Perfect. Three to five times. <laughs> <laughs> it really is the answer. So um, it depends on how you run. You guys ever watch a runner and it's like, oh my god, I just want to pull them over and say, you need to find you a different activity. <laughs> it's, so, it's such a violent motion. So that person's probably closer to like five. And so you ever watch somebody that's like, wow, that person like hopped out of the womb as a runner? Like that's probably more than three. Okay. But that, that gives you the idea. That little muscle is supposed to support the foot when you're when you're doing that. 
Um, and that, that's commonly, so if you're over pronating over and over again, you guys have like arch issues and you're trying to post the, the arch, which we'll talk about a little bit, but that, um, that muscle goes under a lot of stress and it's very common to have problems with that, either an itis, right? So an inflammatory response or sometimes partial tears, sometimes complete tears. And then tarsal tunnel, anybody know what the tarsal tunnel is? Exactly, it's like the carpal tunnel. Anybody, you guys heard of carpal tunnel, right? What's carpal tunnel? Yeah, there you go. So you got like pain here, numbness, tingling. Typically, someone that does a lot of like fine motor type stuff, like typing, a lot of that kind of stuff. It's an inflammation there, puts pressure on the nerve, causes numbness, tingling. Um, typically, um, unfortunately, um, can be released. So they'll go in there and like, do surgery to try to take the pressure off of it instead of correcting the actual problem. Um, but that, you have a similar issue in the tarsal tunnel. So anybody that comes in with um, heel pain or, or medial ankle pain and a heel, um, bottom of the foot pain, and they can have some tarsal tunnel, right? So I just told you three structures that are all in the same area. So how are you gonna tell which one is causing the problem? It's hard, it's really hard. But um, don't think about that, that's kind of more our area of expertise. You guys just have to kind of know how to handle the problems that are um, causing this tissue irritation. So this is where the tissue irritation is, but that just tells you kind of where the symptoms are presenting. You've got to kind of find out what the cause of that is. So Dakota's going to talk about that. Etiology is just like what's causing that problem. There is a foot structure there too, to your right. Oh man, you guys got a foot? A bony foot. Man, All right. this looks fancy. I'm going to not like break this Don't or break something. Don't break the shelf. Yeah, yeah, the shelf right. is more of the yeah. consistent. Yeah. <laughs> right, gently, I'm going to let someone else place it back. So I don't want to break it. I don't want to be held responsible. So. Uh, the next part, like Travis said, the etiology, so why this is happening. So to start before we even talk about the foot structure, if you guys have someone that comes in, they say, hey, I want to get into running, what do you recommend? Like, how do you fit them for a shoe? I, I really want to know. I'm just really interested because this thing is a good way to go jump into foot structure. So I just want to get an idea. Both of us want to get an idea. I know. I never run. Uh, I, I need a shoe. What are you guys going to do for me? <laughs> so, no, I'm just saying that's how we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, t so what does that look yep. like, basically? Yeah. All right, take my shoes off, right? And then what happens? Okay. Good. All right, and then what? Ooh, pineapple. Know, pineapple socks, yep. You work with TV and show us where to take it. And you're going to watch me walk. We went straight away. Perfect. Straight us. What are you looking for? Instability. Okay, what's instability look like? Okay, so if you get a lot of motion in the foot? Or, or, or no motion. Okay, right. No motion or a lot of motion. Or, or just right motion. How about that? Does that ever happen? <laughs> that probably <didn't> happen. <laughs> Occasionally. All right, so you're going to take a look at how the, like, the structure of the foot. You're going to watch it while it's moving, which is great. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else in the process? Squat. Okay, well, look at a squat. Okay, what are you looking for in a squat? Kind of same thing. So what happens to uh, your foot? You have the arch collapses in if one leg drops in to the inside. Right. Also, if you have a lot of toes showing from the back, you look at the back to see the Achilles. Okay, so you're looking at kind of out toeing, like are people are doing that. Okay, all right. Yeah, Anything else? Yeah, the heel pop up really quick when they start. Got it. That would tell you what? Okay. Could be, we'll talk about that. It shows a lack of dorsiflexion, which it can be a tight Achilles for sure. We measure your foot like unweighted and then weighted to okay. see how much the arch drops with weight on it. Okay, how do you measure that? Are you getting like a, like a ruler? Is kind of looking at a device. Okay, so on the side there you can see hey. So it's like foot, like shoe sizes. Okay, so you look there. It's like do you put like a, like partial weight onto it and then full weight onto it? Is that kind of so what it says? So these stools, no weight. That's unweighted and then okay. standing on the brand. Okay, you're looking for the difference from when they're yeah. unweighted to weighted. Great. Okay. And what do you? What's a, a reasonable amount of drop that you guys look for? Or do you, do you measure it? You're just kind of like, mm, that's a lot, or this little half a, size. half a size. Okay. So when I'm up here, when I go to push down, then my foot gets a little bit longer, and then so you're just you're measuring it by the length. Great. Okay. So in physical therapy, that, that's really great information. Actually, we'll look at like the actual arch height if we want to do it. I'm lazy. I don't want to do that. But I'll just kind of eyeball it. I mean, I've looked at 5,000 feet at this point, so I kind of know what I'm looking at. But for us, we'll look at the height of it. So look at the navicular bone, which is kind of the bone on the inside. Ooh, the right there. Yeah. So there, and then we look at how much that drops. But I like the way that you guys do it. That's we like got a little, little uh, heat thingy too. Yeah, So you stand on that. Leaves a little heat print. So okay, that's what I was talking about. Wet foot on paper. Wet foot, yeah, I said that's what I was saying too. Yep. All right, so, so basically exactly what everybody's been talking about here is similar to what we've been, we would do. So what you guys are doing already, 
definitely keep doing. So the foot structure and the big reason why you, does anybody have an idea why you're looking at the arch drop? So how someone's foot looks unweighted versus weighted, do you guys have any idea? So we you already heard Travis talk a bunch about some of these structures that are at the arch. So that is, wow, that's awesome. All right, keep going, sir. All right, so <laughs> Travis talked about a bunch of the structures in the beginning, right? So the plantar fascia, the posterior tip tendon. So if you're not looking at foot structure and you don't know if that arch is dropping or not, if someone's arch is dropping a lot, what's one structure that Travis talked about earlier that is really supporting the arch that could be getting irritated if someone's running? Good, great. So that's why you're doing that. Okay, so we want to make this more about why you do something than just being able to do it. Like, it's great to do it, but then if someone says, oh, well, why are you giving me this shoe? Like, what's it supposed to do? It's supporting the foot, okay? So with a low arch, you can see something more like the posterior tip tendon because that arch just keeps dropping, putting more pressure on the structure that runs there, okay? It's supposed to be giving it support. It's basically sagging down all the joints and all the bones if they continue to drop and all the non-connective or the connective tissue, the non-contractile structure, so none of the muscles those are putting more pressure on the, on the tendon there, it's gonna be leading to irritation. Now, what about if you have someone that has a really high arch? So we talked about the low arch. I feel like everybody talks, oh, I have a really low arch, I have a flat foot. I think I hear like all my patients say I have a flat foot. But what about the opposite? Then they're rigid, they don't have much movement, and they can have problems because they don't have much of a structure. Yep, so the plantar fascia, so when they, when they do try to splay their foot out, put weight through it, they could be having plantar fasciitis. And we talk, didn't talk about really ankle range of motion yet, we'll be getting to that. But typically what I've seen in the clinic is someone that has a tight foot in terms of their arch is also gonna have a really tight Achilles tendon or, and then leading to inability to re even rock over that foot just because of the connective tissue that lies there. So again, when someone says, okay, I have this high arch, so you guys, sounds like you're giving someone that has a low arch, some arch support, what are you gonna do for someone that has a high arch? Curex. <laughs> Curex. 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 Okay, what's Curex? Curex? It's an insert? Okay. So how is that different than whatever, what insert or what type of shoe are you giving someone that has a flat foot? How do those compare? So I always, I, I tend to talk about foot and shoe balance between rigidity and flexibility. Okay. You have to keep it more in layman's terms for the yeah. customer. Mm -hmm. so you have a high rigid foot but the high arch you, we don't, you know they measure the same size standing as they did seated you know we're typically looking at a shoe that's going to be you know give them cushioning because they're not getting their natural shock absorption out of the foot and then also some natural pliability to it because their foot's already fairly rigid conversely you have that hyper pliable kind of pancake foot that just flattens out we want something a little bit more structurally sound a little bit more rigid. so that's generally generally what's going to Awesome, good. So that's really the big thing that we want to talk about in terms of the foot. So you're just, that's the why then. And if someone asks, you know, you can give them the layman's terms and sometimes people want more than that. So it's always good to be able to have both of those in your toolbox. There. Engineers, you guys ever fit engineers for shoes? <laughs> they like the tech. They, they want to know everything. Yeah. Yep. This same, one's blown with there. <laughs> Same thing in PT. All right, so the next part is external rotator activation. Now this is actually less towards the foot, but it's actually a little bit more towards the hip. So I know that I did the hip strengthening series, so a lot of that was already kind of engaged towards this. So if you have anybody that you're trying to kind of point in this direction, obviously send them that way, and then you already have that at your, your toolbox. But one thing that you can see, so if you have someone that has poor um, ankle stability and their hip might look like it's diving in now you might think okay it could be their knee but what could be happening when they go and do their squat evaluation really if their knees are coming in they just have an inability to externally rotate the femur so the hip bone they can't get down that far and then that could be leading to then more of this over pronation so you might look like they're pronating at their foot but really it's that their hip is diving in so that's one thing that you want to look at as well. We'll have some evaluative techniques later on, but that's what we're talking about when we're talking about external rotator activation. So weakness at the hip can give us issues down at the foot. So that's one thing that we don't want to uh, miss there. Okay. And lastly, we have already talked about this a little bit, inability to control the medial longitudinal arch. So exactly what Travis was saying earlier, that's typically that person that has a more pliable foot that we were talking about. So more of that arch that just keeps sinking, sinking every time. So Travis says, imagine every time that person puts weight on that one foot, their arch sinks you know, a few millimeters every time, just repetitively, that's where you get those overuse injuries and run, okay?
All right, so you guys already have evaluation techniques. We'll show you a couple of what we do. Probably some, something similar to what you have. You might learn something new from what we do. But really, you could find out a lot about someone's foot by getting them in single limb stance. Do you ever look at somebody in single limb stance? Okay, so, yeah, so we're going to show you how to do this. I mean, if you watch somebody walk, you're watching them in single limb stance, right? Because at some point, they have to have all their weight on, on one side. So same thing as going up and down stairs. Um, so they have to have all their weight on one side in order to do that. So when we evaluate somebody, the first thing we look at, and everybody can stand up and do this, right? <laughs> I thought you were going to do it. As a all right, so let's stand up. <laughs> hey, and just stand on one foot. How long should you be able to stand on one foot? An hour or so. An hour. I wouldn't say an hour. That would be great. That would be great. For a long time. I wonder what the record is. Yeah, so somewhere between 30 and 60 seconds. Um, so for us, evaluating runners versus evaluating, you know, someone who's a, a fall for risk or a risk for falls at home is a little bit different. If you can stand on your foot for 30 seconds without too much trouble, you're not really a risk for falls, or you're certainly much like less, much less likely to fall at home. But now we're looking at, okay, you guys are all young, healthy individuals. You probably don't have a problem with this. But what, what, is, what, is, what is happening at the foot when you stand in, on, in single limb stance? So, what, so if, you, yeah, if, we, if you had somebody that we walked back and forth and their foot was going all over the place, what might you expect when you get them in single limb stance? Yeah, a lot of them moving around. They might kind of... Yeah. So is that good or bad? It depends, right? So there's no like definites in anything that, that we do, right? Is that good or bad? If they can control it, they don't have any problem, they don't fall over, um, is, and they don't have any problems going on, is that like a disastrous thing? It's, Whoa, we need to fix this right now. I, I want to know what their activity level is. Oh, yeah, I've been running five miles a day for the last 10 years. I'm like, well, you're doing all right. Like, whatever you're doing, <laughs> you've got to figure out. Yeah, I've never had any pain. No, I'm not going to say that, right? You know what the uh, injury incidence for a runner is? What percentage of runners over the course of five years will have an injury? 100%. Yeah, it's about 80% a year. So if you run for a year, it's an 80% chance you're going to have something that happens there. right? Maybe not devastating enough to get you to stop running, but it's, it's a very high injury rate. So that, you know, your higher level athletes are probably going to do pretty good with that. It's, it might not give you a ton of information. If they're going all over the place, that'll give you some information. But the next level to that is to look at them in a single limb squat. So I want everybody to do, who thinks they're really good? They have really strong hip, really strong knee, really strong foot. Anybody? Yeah, Alex? Yeah, look at these Alex? Alex? All right, now let's go up here. Okay, I, I'll preface this with... Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. All right. This, Alex, is, this, is, this Alex, is the guy... Alex, come on! I'll preface this. I looked it for the first time two days ago in nine months. Yeah. So, so here's, this is wrong. what happens when I go golfing with my buddies. So yeah, like, oh, yeah, man, yeah. I haven't golfed. Oh, I haven't golfed. Golf is so long. <laughs> All right, so stand on one foot. Let's, let's evaluate Alex's foot. Okay, so he's moving around a little bit. But he's upright, right? And then he, he normalizes out, right? He gets his body, gets used to it. Okay, now what we're gonna do is, same foot, all you're gonna do is a single limb squat. So you're just gonna go down as far as you wanna go, okay? And then come back up, good. And then go back down, and then come back up. What do you guys see when he does that? You guys see anything? I'm watching his face. <laughs> <laughs> supposed to watch his knee. All right, okay, so for a simple question on this. What's that? So you mean like he, he pronates a little bit more? No. 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 Because he puts his weight more on his on the front of his foot. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Use lamest term. We're... So he puts. There you go. That is impressive, but <laughs> when I look at his hip and his knee, anybody see anything happen in his knee? Like I said. <laughs> yeah. So when he squatted down, especially at the very beginning of the movement, his knee kind of came in a little bit. So what you would ideally want to see is when, if I did this perfectly, my foot would stay pretty stable, my knee would stay over the outside of my foot, and my pelvis would stay low. So when I squat down, I don't care, I mean, he goes into a pistol squat because it's a show off. Most, <laughs> your, most of the people that come in are not going to be able to do that, right? Which is fine. But when you get into a squat, so if they have pain, so we'll talk about that right now. If you have pain with movement, that's not okay. Uh, a lot of runners will think, hey, you know, well, I have pain, like, that's just part of the deal. Um, you're, you're only gonna do that for so long and then something really bad's gonna happen and then you're gonna end up on our table. So 
if you have pain with any of the stuff that we do, then that's like a, a red flag that we'll eventually talk about. But in ideal circumstances, if I stand on one foot and I do a mini squat, my knee stays over the outside of my foot and my pelvis stays level. So the other thing we see here is it gets down further. Now you went all the way down, which is impressive. But as you get down further, what happens is sometimes your pelvis will drop like that. Okay. So what does that mean? So when I go here and I do this, where do you think I might have weakness? Yeah, so outside your hips, so hip external rotators. These small muscles, almost like the rotator cuff. You guys have heard of rotator cuffs for shoulders, right? Almost never get tears or any kind of, you'll get, you know, some inflammation in there, but it's, all, it's really rare to have an injury there. It's super common to have weakness there. And if you're not turning those muscles on, you can't control your femur. And I'll tell you right now, if your knee gets to the inside of your big toe, nothing good happens. So now they're doing this, you're like, oh, wow, this is like, you know, on one foot, I'm, I'm getting a cylinder squat. Well, I'm not going to be really doing that. Well, no, it's, you're doing three to five times your body weight every time your foot hits the ground. So it's just a matter of time. If you have poor mechanics, it's just a matter of time before something nasty happens. So being able to evaluate that is going to be important. So let's say you guys got that figured out. Like, oh, great. That patient, we always say patient, sorry. When your, your people come in, what are you going to tell them to do? Well, what's you go to Robin's rehab. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yes, I'll pay you after. Um, <laughs> um, so, so not right. Yeah. So not necessarily. We want you guys to be able to try to treat these people within kind of your. We talk about scope of practice. Like you know, it's not my scope of practice rotator cuff surgery. It's above my pay grade. So when I see someone that needs a rotator cuff surgery, I send them where they gotta go. Um, for you guys, you should be able to try to fix some of this or give them some kind of information to help them out. You're not treating them, but you can say hey, you got some weakness in the outside of your hip, and that might be a problem down the road. Have you ever had, like, and this, this is a, a movement impairment. So we'll see 10 people tomorrow. They'll come in, and they will do this, and they'll all have different problems. One will say, I got pain out here. One will say, oh, I got pain in my groin. One will say, oh, I got pain in the inside of me. One will say, oh, yeah, I got that plantar fasciitis, that stuff on the bottom of my foot. That's just where the tissue is breaking down. The problem is in the movement pattern. So if you can identify that and clean that up, you can fix all of those other problems. Any questions about that? All right, and the last thing I want you guys to start looking at is ankle dorsiflexion. Let me know what that is. Just toes to nose, right? So you go here, wait, how much range of motion occurs here? I'm telling you right now, for foot and ankle problems, 90% of the problem is relieved or fixed. I don't care what it is, any of these things that are up here. If you can get normal dorsiflexion, that will clean up a lot of the problems. What is normal dorsiflexion? Am I now? How far should I be able to bring this up towards my nose? So I'll give you a kind of a quick lesson here. So if this was a 90 degree angle, you guys know what those are, right? 90 degree angle. I've got to be able to get how much past that, do you think? How many degrees? 10 to 20. Perfect. Yep, yeah, I heard 10 to 20, right? 15 is great for runners. Minimum is 10. Like just walking around, like you want to go walk at the mall, like I got to get 10. You want to run, we got to get to 15. Because if you don't get that range of motion, then you start to make compensations around that. I mean, know what typical, comp you already, already talked a little bit about compensations around a lack of dorsiflexion. What will people do when they don't have normal dorsiflexion? They'll do what? They'll heel strike. Yeah, they'll heel strike a little bit more. Like whip their leg around a little bit. So in order to kind of clear, yeah. yeah. So if they don't get normal dorsiflexion, they'll kind of clear. But when they're, yeah, when they're pushing up, they'll do two things. They're over pronate, right? So they're really flatten out that foot, and that's how they'll transition. So when I'm running, I've got to get dorsiflexion when? From here to here, right? So if I don't have it, I'll do one of two things. I'll out toe. So you guys said you're walking and what you start to see some toes on the outside. That's the number one way that they're gonna do that. And the other way that they'll try to get more dorsiflexion as they transition is they'll really over pronate. So it might not seem like it, but when you over pronate, you'll get a little bit of dorsiflexion when you do that. So those are the two big ways that they'll do that. And that's natural, right? They're not thinking about, oh yeah, I'm not getting normal dorsiflexion, I'm gonna start down toe. Their body just naturally falls that way. And then if you can clean up that lack of dorsiflexion, then you'll clean up the inflammatory issues that are typically going on there. All right, so we taught you how to evaluate it. We taught you some basic information about anatomy. So how do we actually fix this stuff? Um, that's what the code is going to talk about. All right, so the first part we've already touched on a little bit in terms of supporting the arch. So we kind of going back to what we talked about before, if you have someone that's a flat foot, obviously the quick fix would just be to support the arch. And we talked about how you find that. So if someone's having a hard time stabilizing their foot in that single limb stance, that's, again, another evaluative technique that you guys have. 
other than just doing that, like Travis said, these are tools that you can use. Just tell them, like if you see that they're struggling to stand on, on one foot and you're having to put that much body weight on that foot repetitively, they have to be strong. So telling them just to simply, hey, like try to spend more time in that single leg stance. That inherently is going to strengthen up the foot and make it much more much more stable when they're spending that amount of time. Now, again, when we're running, we're not spending 30 seconds on it, but the idea is that if you build up the endurance and running it as an endurance activity, that you're going to then translate that into less foot pain with running and more uh, foot stability, okay? I, I have pretty flat feet um, myself, and I actually used to always wear an orthotic, and then when I started actually at Robbins, I said, you know what, I'm not gonna wear it anymore, and I went cold turkey, which was a bad idea, but I also really worked on my foot stability, and now I can run and do anything without any orthotics, and I know that a lot of people get prescribed them, and that, that it wasn't a fix, but it's like if I worked on the muscles that need to be stronger, then I don't need that extra support. Just like anything else, like a brace can support a structure if you know that structure can't do its job, but if we get the structure to actually do its job and function better, then we always don't need that support. But it is a good thing that if you get someone that like is like, hey, I'm in a lot of pain, quick fix is use that for a little while while they still work on supporting their foot by themselves, okay? So that's the first part. Next one, work on ankle dorsiflexion, exactly what Travis just finished off with. So. How would you work on ankle dorsiflexion? ABCs. Okay, ABCs. I so could be working on more like overall foot and foot mobility. How about like anybody that, anybody stretch their calf before they, they go run? Okay, so typically when someone does a calf stretch, they'll usually do it like straight knee. Now, when we run and we strike, we don't run and we don't hit our, our foot completely with our, our, with our knee completely straight, right? And that would probably mess up our knees pretty quickly if we ran like that or we'd be running real weird. So, although I like a calf stretch because a calf stretch you usually get a deep stretch. Has anybody heard of the soleus muscle? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I like that muscle a little bit more and the reason why is because when we run, we run on a flexed knee. When we flex our knee and we bend our knee a little bit, we're already taking some tension off of our gastroc or what the most people think is like your calf muscle, what they look at, okay? So a good way to do a soleus stretch, you can either just do the stretch with a bent knee or you can even do a stretch in kind of half kneeling. You just would put your weight over the front of your foot, okay? This is still working again on that ankle dorsiflexion. And you're also trying to avoid what Travis was saying earlier. So there's some people that will cheat out of this, that if you let them, if they bring their knee into the inside, they pronate a little bit, they'll get more range of motion, but that's not really a pure stretch. So you're not getting a stretch in like the direction that you really want to build up because anybody can compensate and get more range of motion, but you're trying to build up that pure motion and go through the proper running mechanics, okay? So, so the knee goes over? Straight over the front of the foot or even to the outside versus bringing the knee to the inside, that's, that's no go. So you will still get a stretch, but then you're just kind of kicking the can down the road because you're trying to get them to still gain range of motion in the range of motion they already had or the range of motion that they were using to compensate, okay? So that's a big thing. So you want to make sure you're actually stretching the spot where you're really trying to get that stretch. Or uh, somebody say rolling or like doing yeah. some yeah soft tissue mobilization, right? So we like that too. That makes a stretch more effective. Just doing soft tissue mobilization and nothing else will kind of prepare the tissue to run, but it won't lengthen the tissue. So do we stretch before we run or after we run? Both. Both. Okay. Why before? So you don't get hurt. Okay, so <laughs> dynamic warm up for before. Yeah, yeah. Okay, actually stretching before activity that will decrease your ability to do that activity. So it'll like if if we stretch you out really good and we had you do do, you do what, what's your distance you run? Five uh, k marathon, higher <laughs> ultras, right? Okay, so you're at hundred miles. If we stretch you out before. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, for our purposes. If we, if we stretch you out before, and the, the, cl the shorter the distance get, the more impact you have. So for an ultra, eh, maybe not that big of a deal. But for sprinters, like if we stretch the crap out of a sprinter before, they're going to run slower times. So it's more of a dynamic warm up, more of like your AB ankle ABCs, just to try to get blood flow, try to get the tissue contracting and relaxing. That's really important, like dynamic warm up type stuff. And massage before? Do you, so, are you okay with the uh, like rolling out before? A bit? Right, so that before, yeah. And, but most effective for me, I, I'm, there's a lot of like, I don't, I don't even want to say placebo effect, but the mental effect of, man, I just feel a ton better when I roll out my calves. Great, do that. Okay, and if your numbers are getting better, it, it depends on what your goals are. Awesome. To try to lengthen tissue, like actually to get more dorsiflexion, there's a lot you've got to work through. You ever seen an Achilles tendon? Like, not on someone, but like on a cadaver. I've been on cadaver classes. Yeah, 
So that thing is thick. And then the, the, the tissue that connects to your calf, ooh, that is really thick. Like to like do some really like light dynamic warm stuff, that's not gonna get the job done. You gotta do more sustained, like longer prolonged hold. And with that, if you do soft tissue mobilizations and stretches, it just makes the stretch more effective. So would, would it make sense to do the massaging before the stretching? Yes, that, so right, so if we want to try to increase tissue length in our clinic, we'll do some self soft tissue mobilization. We might do some Graston and some like, mobilization that we would do, and then we would do a stretch. We're going to get more effectiveness out of that, for sure. So would you suggest, like an ideal format would be maybe like rolling out, then the dynamic, then the activity, and then, then stretch when you out return, after. Mm -hmm. would you roll out before uh, some of that more intense stretching or after? Always roll up before stretching. Okay. Yeah, if your goal is to try to lengthen the tissue, try to get more range of motion, and that's what you want to do. But there's also a benefit, I just feel better after I do that, so, yeah. yeah. All right, those are good questions. Any other questions? All right, the last one on this list. So this was actually similar to what I gave for the hip strengthening series. So doing a banded squat for the external rotator. So now, again, going for the hips, this is the purpose of the band is just to give feedback to the body to actually then push the knees out and engage the hips. So it's not as easy as just telling someone to do it. Some people, I, I, when they're in the clinic and talking to someone, it's like people call them motor morons. They like you tell them to try to do something and it's like doesn't work no matter what you do. So giving them a cue beyond just saying something is usually a lot easier for most people, especially those that just really have a hard time moving their body. And that's the purpose of the band. Right. So you volunteer. Who wants to work on their hip strength? <laughs> I might bust a sleeve. <laughs> All right. So. No, I have terrible. Good. This is gonna go right below your knees. All right. So go ahead, Dakota. So what would you have them? Just cue them. All right. So you guys, I think you guys have bands in here, don't you? Yeah. Bands you can sell. All right. This is a great way to sell bands. Ready? Okay. Now you're paying attention. All right. All I want you to do is have your feet just a little bit wider apart. So you want just like a hip width stance. Okay. Feet look good there. All I want you to do is push your knees out of the band. Just come down as far as you feel comfortable. Good. And then back up. So I always then say push it out of the band. And yeah, just okay. keep doing a few more reps. All right, so watch what happens to her knees. Keep going. What happens as she comes up? Can I see it? Oh, they wink. So they're coming out. OK. And then when they come up, what happens? She's letting it scoot back in. Right, because this band is doing that. Yeah. It's like forcing it. So the cue that Dakota is talking about is if I've got to keep these knees out the whole time, it just cues me to kind of when I'm running or when I'm doing anything, and this is a little exaggerated, right? You're, you don't want your knee way over the outside of your foot. You want it somewhere over the outside, it's just so it's not in here. You just got to keep it away from in here. Okay? And the more you do that, where do you feel that working? It's going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, more in my glutes than anything else. All right, push, push, push out further. Good. Now like keep, hips now, out further? Uh, your foot position is good, but from here, just go this. Yep. And then down and try to keep those knees out the whole time you do it. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably not a good one to do this on. Hey, where do you feel it more? I think where I'm supposed to be feeling it. Don't think about that. It's going to be on the quiz. Where did I lean? <laughs> it seems like her hips are about busting the seat. It seems like what? <laughs> Going to her left? Yeah, so what does that mean? What if someone shifts their weight over to one side? What's that mean? What's the next question you would ask them? Does something hurt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, could be that, but even like before you get to that, I would say, did you have an injury on your left side? So. Yes, but also on the right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're shifted. Which way do you see her shifting? To the left. Okay. Her left. And your inj injury is where? I have two. I have bilateral injury. Bilateral injury, so we can't, we can't use your side. Well, yeah, I'm so not a good example. You'll, you'll shift weight away from your bad side, and so you want to try to know. Now, are you going to fix that problem with a pair of shoes? Man, probably not, but it's good information to know when you're evaluating somebody. All right, so from here, all right, what I want you to do is just take a step to the right and then step to the left. you got to leave that on. I know, but it's... Oh, it's yeah. cutting into you? <laughs> no, I'm just... All right, so this... It's right where my injury is. So I don't want to do it. Well, don't, I don't want to cause an injury, sir. All right, and then come back to where you came from. Your, your test. I know. All right, so keep going back and forth doing that. When you do that, where do you feel muscles working? Um, she's she's someone who often her her legs go numb when she runs. Oh, you're, you got the numb one. 
<laughs> Why did you volunteer? You messed up all of our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> all right, where do you feel muscles working? Uh, I think my adductors. <laughs> adductors on the inside of your legs? No. On the outside of your legs? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, we're throwing out. <laughs> get up there, Greg. <laughs> Greg, get up there. You have your sweatpants pants on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Come on. <laughs> so this will happen too, right? You'll get some up here, and you're not seeing the typical things that you see. Uh, it makes it a little bit harder, but not everybody lines hurt, up the way you but want. But I, I think that's from work. Your glutes hurt, but you think that's from work? You felt an increase in something turning on your glutes in the last like couple minutes that we've been doing this? Yeah. But I'm gonna argue that. I know. Yeah. Not enough. All right. So here, just kind of push your knees out. Good, and then just kind of squat down. And then go back up. Yeah. <laughs> All, right. All right, so keep doing that. So this is a simple exercise. So what you're trying to do is get people to find their external rotators. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. We're trying to find the easiest way. This probably isn't the number one way we would do it in the clinic, because I think it'd be on the table, we'd do a couple different things. But for you guys, we're like really simple, quick, put a band around your knees, let's see what happens when you do this. If you see somebody that has really poor control in their hip, and they're like, yeah, you're, you're going to have troubles there. Sometimes just kind of getting them to find their external rotators by doing something like this, that might be all they need to do. All right, so as you do this more, where do you feel it? Good. <laughs> okay, so that's where you should feel it, right? And you did like uh, how many squats? Like five or six. Okay, were you starting to feel it a lot or like, nah, not that much? I just, just how I was feeling. You started, okay. Yeah. All right, so now do the same thing. She's just going to go here to the side like this. So step over, yeah, and then step over here. So take as big a steps as you can take. There you go, and let's keep going back and forth there. So, same thing, when you're watching someone do this, make sure they don't do this, and then just kind of like go like that. Okay, they've gotta get external rotation. External rotation is I'm turning my femurs out. Internal rotation where they don't wanna be is turned in. So you're cueing them to kind of get external rotation. All right, as you so do that. So people do the little duck walk or the, yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? So when they're like this? Yeah, when they, they're walking that way. So what's going on up there then? It depends on the population. If it's a young athletic runner, they don't have dorsiflexion. So they don't have the range of motion. So it goes back to the dorsiflexion. Yeah, if it's an older person, yeah. they're trying to get a wider base of support. Because if I stand like this, it's gonna be pretty easy for you to push me over, right? But if I stand like this, it's gonna be really hard for you to push me over. So if you're having balance issues, and even like, like well, you know, how many people come in here with walkers? Probably not that many. So what if it's someone who's like 40? Whoa, whoa. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too far from there. So okay. I'm that. Some of us are over that. So, it, yeah, so those people can have balance problems that they can, they can make compensations around. So, if they're out toed like that, either they have really poor, so if they're out toed and they, they get on one foot and they're like falling apart, that's probably a balance issue. If they get on one foot and they're okay, but then if they go into a squat and they can't, like if you have really bad dorsiflexion, you're not even gonna be able to get, you'll go, you'll go like this and then you'll start to do stuff out of your hip. Like you can't even get down into certainly a pistol squat, but you're not gonna be able to get down into a squat. So it's, if someone does that, it's usually one of those two problems. They don't have normal uh, dorsiflexion or their balance is so poor that they like to do that because they get their base of support wider so it's better for their balance. That's a good question. I feel like I see a lot of like teens who do that, who like, duck foot but then but they're not necessarily here for running shoes like they're just here for like shoes just for going to school or like every day you know their mom brings them in so then at that point is that something we shouldn't focus on so much or like uh, what kind of luck are you going to have going over and telling a teenager hey <laughs> you need to kind of point your your feet ahead I don't know. Like, I don't know oftentimes it's one of the parents exactly the kid, the kid walks by and the parents like, like yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, right. 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 Yeah. So there, I mean, typically kids now are doing a lot of sitting, right? They're in computer work or on their phones. Mm -hmm. So just sitting, you're just turning off all the muscles in your body. I mean, especially from here to here. But your external rotators, they're not even getting turned on. Like, kids are at home, games, TV. They're not even, like, activating stuff. So they will start to do that. And another thing they're doing is kind of resting on their ligaments. So they don't have to turn a lot of muscles on when they do this, and they, especially if you see them kind of sink in like that, or you'll see a kid that will do this. They'll shift over here, and they'll shift over here, and then they'll go back and forth. I'm just hanging on the ligaments on the outside of my hips because if I have to stand normally, I've got to activate these muscles. And if I'm not doing that a lot, then that's what I'll do. So what about pinching toes? Coming in? 
And you don't, you just don't see that that often. That's I mean, when's the last time you saw someone come in pigeon toed? Uh, only he was nine years old. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's typically, and you'll you'll see that in the younger population. That'll typically get corrected through pediatrics and that kind of stuff. Do you guys see a lot of people that come in here with pigeon toes? Not a lot. No, yeah. And if it is, I see that they have more like hip issues, so they're kind of compensating for something up that could be something that they were just born with, so their hip is not aligned, quote unquote, normal. So it's just that the way that their hip is presenting and what they're gonna do is to walk with a more like neutral hip position, they'll actually pigeon toe in to avoid that position. Now again, that's rare. So even, even there's some people that will walk like this because their hips are just designed differently, but I would say that that's not a huge population. It's more likely that someone's either lacking dorsiflexion, like Travis said, or the hip external rotator, so they're just gonna hang out in this position that's just a little bit easier um, to hang out in. So that's gonna be a little, lot more common. Now, if you do those things and it doesn't fix it, then it's just think something you're checking off, like, well, that didn't work, check. So it's like, well, you're not just gonna keep doing the same thing. But good question. All right. So we kind of with the band, when you had them do the, the side steps, when you did the hip exercise, we did it down by the ankles, whereas this was up closer to the knees. Is that it? Like, what's the difference between those two? Is there? What do, you, what do you think the difference is, if you were to guess? I, well, I know it looks like you can get a lot farther for a stretch, on a stretch or, uh, or further legs out. further apart when it's down by your ankles, but yeah. it's also a, a, a looser band, I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, so I don't know which one. Yeah, the further away from your center of gravity, the harder it's going to be. Okay. So it's actually kind of the opposite of what you said. Like, I get down by my ankles, in order to do that, ooh, that's going to be a lot of work. Okay. But if it's further up, it makes it a little bit easier. So that's how you can grade the exercise. You know, so that band just looks like it's tighter. Though. It's thin, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, it's really thick. <laughs> so if you, that yeah, sounds I like, oh know. man, you need to buy <laughs> seventeen bands because depending on what you're doing, you, can, you just buy one band, and then it's like, okay, the further up you go, it'll get easier. The further down you go, it'll get harder. And the other thing is the cueing too. It's going to be hard for you to tell someone to cue their hip when the band's all the way at the knees. So yeah, if like we wanted to focus just maybe on on hip strengthening, then you can just move the legs, but if you're really focusing on the external rotation part of it, then putting it around the knees, you're going to have to cue there. It's gonna be hard to tell someone, push out in the band, your knees, and then it's at your ankles. So it's just about where it's placed and what you're trying to get out of it. So um, yeah, it's gonna be harder if you put it down by your foot. Now that would be probably better for someone, again, that's been doing this exercise. They already know what to do with their knee. So then they go to do it and they're putting their knee in a good position, activating that, and then they're just making it a little bit more resistant. So the big thing is you got to kind of look at this stuff and identify it, and then you've got to kind of pick the correct modality to try to help them out. So uh, where most people will kind of stall on this, like, I don't know, I'm not a physical therapist. I don't know how to evaluate this stuff. Just have them stand on one foot. Like, just start there. So it's like, all right, what happens to this person when they get on one foot? And just know when, if they ask you questions about it, don't get nervous about that. Oh, what does that mean? It's like, well, you know, when you stand on one foot, your balance isn't that great. And think about it. When you're running, you know, you're spending a lot of time all on one foot. So if you're falling apart just standing here doing it, we know that when you run, it's three to five times your body weight, you're gonna put a lot more stress through that. So we need to try to find a shoe that's gonna help you get a little bit better control of your foot so that you have a lower likelihood of injuries. Any questions about anything? All right, so the last thing on there is kind of your, all right, here's my ejector seat. Like this is above my pay grade, which happens to me and Dakota all the time, right? So if they've had the problem for more than 30 days, so someone comes in and it's like, hey man, do people come in and say, oh, my foot's killing me, can you give me a shoe that's gonna fix that problem? Do people do that? Mm -hmm. Okay, right? So uh, a lot of times, we, uh, we talked about the support stuff, we give them the right support, it will fix that problem, so good job. Sometimes it doesn't, right? And they come back, like, yeah, I still got the same problem. If you've had a problem for more than 30 days and it hasn't changed, if it hasn't gotten better, and if it's staying the same or getting worse, there's something there. You know runners, they're gonna push through it and they're fine, oh, that's fine, it's my normal pain. It's my normal amount of pain. Um, eventually, that's gonna run into a, a problem. So um, you can give them tools to try to help that. Whether they take the tools, that's, you know, that's not under your control, but it's like, hey, you know, if that's been going on for a long time, why don't you gotta go over and get a free screen? You should go see these guys, they work with us, you can get a free screen, it's 30 minutes, it doesn't cost you anything, like, how can you say no to that? Let's get it checked out. So that's the problem there. Change your footwear doesn't improve their symptoms. Everybody come in and say, hey, I'm gonna change my footwear. You give them shoes and it doesn't make it better. Does that ever happen? Right. So you guys, just based on the conversation we've had here, I know you guys how to know how to evaluate this stuff. And you put them shoes that are supposed to fix the problem. If you put them in shoes that are supposed to fix the problem and it doesn't fix the problem, that problem's probably bigger than a shoe change, right? So you've gotta get that checked out. And then pain doesn't immediately go away with cessation of activity. So if they stop running, 
and the pain doesn't go away. Like, yeah, I still have the same pain. I stopped running and just like going up and down stairs or just standing at work is bothering me. That's still a problem. Then that's something that needs to be addressed. Because if you don't catch it at the physical therapy level, you're going to catch it at the surgeon level. And you don't want to do that because then it's just a ton of physical therapy after that. So you're giving those guys options. So what we were told to do is kind of give you guys some tools to help you out with this. So we don't expect you to spend 45 minutes and give them a, a, a workout. You know, she can do that because she's a, an instructor. So I, I, she's probably better at treating hips than I am, right? So she knows that stuff, but you don't have time to do it. So what we're going to do is make you guys some rack cards. So it's like, hey, you've got a foot problem. You go all over the stuff that we taught you and we're going to quiz you on so that you know how to do that and evaluating it. But for you guys to fix that with exercise, mobilizations, a lot of stretches, that's going to be time consuming for you guys. So we're going to give you guys rack cards that will give them information and give them some of the stretches and the exercises that we do. It'll bring them back to our, our website and they'll go through a landing page and just kind of be like, here's hip exercises you can do if you're having this problem. So if you guys have the time and want to do that, great. I encourage you guys to teach all this stuff to as many people as you can. But sometimes you're slamming the store and you don't have time to do that. So we'll have information like, hey, check this out. If you're having hip problems, here's the card on hip, all this information. And then on the back side, if, if you want to get checked out by the PTs over at Robbins Rehab, here's the QR code. Just go get a free screen with those guys. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Easy. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to make your guys' life easier. And what is it that makes you guys different than Big Boss? I don't know. Has anybody ever been to a Robbins Rehabilitation? I have. Okay. I, I don't know. I can say all sorts of shit as long as these people <laughs> <laughs> we're awesome well no you, you had asked Bruce the same thing in the office so I did yeah so uh, I mean I can tell you but I would rather I you, tell you want me to tell you so um, why are you guys different than uh, uh, what, what are sneaker stores Dick's. Dick's. there you go Dick's Sporting Goods why would I come here instead of Dick's Sporting Goods we're knowledgeable right personalized right so they know you right and you know them and you guys care right so do you think the kid that's pulling the nine and a half at Dick's Cares, he's a nice kid, but you know, he probably <laughs> doesn't go to seminars at eight o'clock at night for physical therapists for, <laughs> that have now gone over 15 minutes in time. Um, yeah, we just care more. So if we have a, a, a close relationship with our patients, we just take more ownership of the people that come in the door. Uh, and we're not going anywhere. So I've been doing this, the PTs that I have now, it's either like the only job they've had or the only job they want. So if you are gonna, Dakota works in Bethlehem, um, so you know, like, hey, you should go see Dakota, and he's going to check you out. So, any other questions? I, yeah. I had a question back, and when you were doing the ankle dorsiflexion. Yeah. How, how do you measure that? Oh, we measure it with a. I, it, eyeball, like, I, I mean, but in the store. Yeah, you eyeball it. Yep. So I'm, I'm, I can give you guys goniometers if you want. <laughs> Would you if you use them? So, show us bad, fair, and like ideal. So we said what degree is neutral? What did we say? 90. 90 degree is zero. That's crack dorsiflexion. Someone comes in with zero and they want to run, like you might as well just give them my card right now. So <laughs> 10 is like a minimum. So it's like zero to 10 degrees is nothing. Like <laughs> zero to 10 degrees, like unless you're looking at feet all day long, like me in Dakota, you're not going to pick up on that. So with students that come in the road set, they have to measure it. They have to get an actual measuring tool out and measure, and by the way, make sure that they keep their foot in neutral. They're not over pronating or everting to kind of try to get some more dorsiflexion. But for the most part, if you're looking at their foot, you're just looking at, okay, how much past a 90 degree angle is that? Is that 10 degrees? Then that's normal. If some people will have a ton of it, not many, because very few people have normal dorsiflexion. They just kind of make compensations around the lack of it. Um, but yeah, it's not much. You get them at 90 degrees, I gotta get 10 degrees past that. And even, I mean, even if you're like, oh geez, is that, Eight, is that 10, is that 12? Like we would be able to tell that from across the room. We don't expect you guys to be able to do that. But the more you look at it, and just, just, just take a look at it. And it's really just the more reps of, okay, hey, bring your foot up towards you. Like, oh, okay, that guy said like 90 degrees. And if you guys want goniometers, I'll drop them off. Like you, if you are okay measuring that, it's a, it's a really simple thing to do. I can teach you in 30 seconds. And it's really the most important thing in a foot. Like if you can get them to dorsiflexion past 10 degrees, you're gonna fix almost all their problems. You said you eyeball the arch. Mm -hmm. How? Like, is there even a measuring device? So we would measure millimeters and drop from a neutral, like, I mean, it's what you guys do, right? So it's, it's like you guys do it longitudinally, which I kind of like. Um, ours is a little bit more complicated. There's a little bit more interrelator, uh, so poor reliability. A, a, a 
Not a weight bearing to weight bearing. Yep. So we'll just. How much it goes down. Yeah, and you look. Yeah, and you look at it when you walk too, right? So that's the same thing. Like from here, you're non weight bearing. You know, the very first part, it goes fast. I mean, if you're not, looking, you get, but you guys look at feet all day. So from here, like what happens with their foot? If they drop down six millimeters, is what is supposed to be like allowable according to research. But you're just kind of looking at it. I mean, if you're seeing this thing, like we call them Mississippi mud suckers, right? They go right down to the ground. You see that? So if you see that, it's like, yeah, we got to get some more control on that shoe. And then I know how you guys do it because I've been fitted for shoes here. Like put shoes on, and you're like, all right, go outside and run, and just kind of see what that feels like. For the most part, that is not a terrible way to evaluate, right? So if someone's like, yeah, that feels really good. This isn't rocket science, right? So if it feels really good, um, then you probably found a shoe that matches up that's giving them the support they don't have. So we'll talk really quickly about um, orthotics. Are orthotics a good idea for everybody? Everybody should have one? No? Okay. Right. So, yeah, it can be super helpful. So, yeah, yeah. So, so finding the right insoles for everybody, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting an orthotic. There's, there's some people that there's nothing we're going to do. So Dakota had to give the story. He's like, yeah, I kind of weaned off my orthotic. Well, he did a cold, cold turkey, which, which you don't do. Yep. Um, but it's like I kind of weaned off it. And then what happens? My, my foot gets stronger. Because the disadvantage of an orthotic is it's kind of doing the job that your muscles are supposed to do. In, in our case, you know, we spend a lot more time with them. Like we're spending 16 hours with these people. So we have the time to kind of work on that problem. You guys don't have the time to work on that problem. So you're using the tools that are available to you. But just knowing that what an orthotic does, I may have eyeglasses. Okay, when you go back to your doctor, they're like, uh, your eyes are getting stronger, and the lens gets thicker and thicker. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's pretty common. Why is that happening? Mm -hmm. it's just lazy. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's a muscle, right? So now I'm not going to tell you. Oh yeah, everybody can fix their eye problems with eye exercises. Some people can. Not everybody can fix their problem with kind of arch strengthening, hip, hip structure stuff. But guess what? Like we're invested. Like that's what we do for a living. So yeah, if I'm gonna fix my arch, like plus we know exactly what to do to do that. And you've got to get invested in that. It's a, it's a lot of work. But just so you know, like you go from uh, orthotic motion control shoe, and then eventually this person does this for the next 40 years. They're gonna be wearing that big ass orthotic shoe that's ugly as hell because their foot hasn't done any work in the last 20 years. So now, for runners, a little bit different, right, than just someone who's, like for us, if you're just walking around, um, runners can get a lot more muscle activation, and they don't need as much support unless they have a really terrible structured foot. Like, you've got someone that goes all the way down to the ground, there ain't nothing I'm going to do to fix that, right? So you've got to support that somehow if they want to run. And the more they ask out of their body, the more they're going to have to do in terms of work, exercises, and kind of some support. So for the most part, we try to get people off orthotic when appropriate. Some people are not appropriate to come off an orthotic. But just know that an orthotic and a motion control shoe is doing the job that the muscles are supposed to do. And if you continue to do that, we'll have the eyeglasses problem where it's like every time they come in, we've got to give them more and more support. Any questions about that? What's the whole of the stretch from the dorsiflexion? What, how long should you hold a stretch if you want to change the length of muscle yeah. tissue? What do you think? 30, 30 seconds. Anybody have any other guesses? 30 to 60. 30 to 60? One dollar. One dollar. <laughs> Price is right style, right? So two minutes. If you, want, if you want to change the length of tissue, you got to hold it for two minutes. This is this concept? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. So now you can find out why nobody <laughs> stretches. <laughs> so... If you want to actually change the length, it's hard, man. It is hard to change the length of tissue. How many times a day? I mean, it depends on a lot of different things. So like every day, <laughs> two minutes at least every That's day. Yeah. Do, you ever, do you check your phone for more than two minutes a day? <laughs> all right. It's all you know. <laughs> yeah. So you can't, you can't, you can't tell. I, I've got a great routine for you. It's going to take 20 minutes to do. Like, no one's going to do that. So, like, hey, we got to work on your balance. I just need you to stand on one foot for 20 minutes a day. Now, do you ever do something where you're, like, washing dishes? Could you wash dishes on one foot? Well, I do so the great. one. Brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth in one foot? Yeah. Perfect. I work great. on one foot. There you go. Perfect. That's all you got to do. Computer work. Like, putting dishes, like, through the dishwasher. Like, whatever. Just give, kind of work that into what they do. Don't give them a 20-minute program they got to do. ain't got to do that. So, so, for the stretching, it's like, ah, oh, two minutes. That's a lot of time. i got a couple muscles I want to work on. I know you're on your phone for more than two minutes a day. So get on your phone, do the stretches. When you're watching TV, like get down on the ground, do the work. Yeah. Anything else? Do you guys have anything else at home? You can unmute yourselves if you have any questions.
Bruce, I think his eyes are open, but he's really sleeping. No, that's not true. <laughs> he's been watching me the whole time. <laughs> No, All right. Great. Yeah. Sorry, we went over time. Okay, that happens, but anyway. okay. Uh, yeah, we're good. All right. And now the beer is out. Now? I know. Yeah. There's some in the fridge. <laughs> All right. So you guys gonna get quizzed on this stuff? It's not gonna be a really hard quiz. Just make sure you're paying attention. But start using this stuff. Just start looking at this. Even if you just look at single limb stance, like, oh no, the squat mechanics. I don't know about that. Just have somebody stand on one foot and just see what happens to their arch. And then use that as a tool amongst all the other really cool tools that you use to pick shoes for people. The more you do it, the better you get it. And the more you'll see. Like the first time you look at it, like, I don't see anything. Oh my God. And then the thousandth time you look at it, it's like, oh yeah, I can see this with my eyes closed. You just gotta do reps. And what are we going over the next two ones? Yep. What do you guys wanna do next? So we're gonna do um, lumbar spine and knee. And you guys, I know we see hip problems, but with lumbar spine and knee, you're gonna get a lot of crossover. So instead of doing four classes, I don't wanna listen to me that long. We'll do three classes. So it's either spine or knee. What do you guys want to do next? Spine. Spine it is. All right. All right. All right, guys. Thank you guys so Thanks. much. All right. Thank you. Thanks. 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 I'm going to set it under the tree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.